Okay, so dear friends, here we are meeting again in another event of the Holocaust Studies Program at Western Galilee College to discuss an intriguing topic, contemplating Holocaust memory in post-colonial society. And uh, let me just share my screen for a minute. Gradually, we are all getting used to this previously unknown platform of the Zoom and find its benefits. Today, we have a moderator from Southampton, England, panelists from Israel and Canada, and audience from the entire world. I'm not sure we will be able to go back to the traditional conferences that required long flights, carrying luggage, and high expenses, but we are all missing the mingling in between lectures. It is important to us at the Western Galilee to bring to the forefront various voices of scholars and new innovative topics in our field of interest, like we will hear about today. But first, I am honored to introduce to you our moderator. Tony Kushner is professor in the Parks Institute for the study of Jewish and non-Jewish relations and history department at the University of Southampton. He has written wildly on the British Jewish experience, especially social history and comparative migration. He is the author of eight monographs and his most recent books are The Battle of Britishness, Migrant Journeys Since 1685 and Journeys from the Abyss, the Holocaust and Forced Migration from 1880s to the present. He is currently working on a fascinating study of the life and legacy of a Jewish triple murderer in Sussex, Jacob Harris. Professor Kushner works with Dr. Amy Bunting on co-presence to the Holocaust, British soldiers in Auschwitz and Belzen. He is co-editor of the journal Patterns of Prejudice and deputy editor of Jewish Culture and History. And uh, here are some technical notes. We are recording this session and will upload it to our website and please keep your microphones on mute. If you have any questions for our panelists, please write them down on the chat and at the beginning mention the name of the person you are asking. As always, I want to thank Dr. Boaz Cohen, head of the program, Dr. Ronnie Mikkel Arielli and Jan Buzlaf from the organizing team. I hope we will have a stimulating event. Professor Kushner, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Daniela, and uh, welcome to what I think is going to be a, a fascinating evening. Uh, we have done uh, various works at the Parks Institute, particularly in relation with our partners in Sydney and Cape Town on uh, this, this field and it's really exciting to see it still developing and, and really important work ongoing. So I, I think this is part of a, a very important conversation. So the format's going to be uh, three uh, papers, which we will take uh, in, in turn and then we'll have general discussion. Well, I, I will lead off the, the discussion. So uh, I will introduce each speaker in turn. So I'm delighted to introduce Sarah Phillips Castile, who uh, was part of a, a, our sort of dialogue uh, in Cape Town some years ago. Uh, 
where we were developing themes that we're going to discussing tonight. Uh, Sarah is Professor of English at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada, and she's also uh, an appointment in the Institute of African Studies, and I think that reflects that, that uh, duality that we're going to hear about tonight. She's author of um, Calypso Jews, Jewishness in the Caribbean Literary Imagination, um, Columbia University Press, which is a fantastic book and I really recommend it. And it uh, rightly won a Canadian Jewish Literary Award. She's also co-editor of Caribbean Jewish Crossings, Literary History and Creative Practice uh, from last year. Her current uh, book project uh, addresses literary and visual representations of, of black victims of Nazi persecution. And tonight she's going to be talking about decolonizing Holocaust memory in Caribbean literature, Haitian writer, Louis Philippe D'Alembert. Sarah. Thank you so much, uh, Tony, for the, the kind introduction. Um, this is a nice continu uh, in a way, uh, continuation of our earlier discussions back in, in Cape Town and London. And thank you so much um, to Ronnie for the invitation. I I'm really uh, pleased to be part of this uh, discussion and it's been exciting to see how much more space has been opening up recently for these kinds of discussions at the intersection of Holocaust studies and postcolonial studies. Um, so my own research over the last decade or so has sought to contribute to these discussions by drawing attention to a pattern of repeated reference in Caribbean literature to two uh, Jewish historical traumas, the Iberian expulsion and the Holocaust. With regard to the latter, Caribbean fiction and poetry attest both to the global circulation of Holocaust icons and to how Holocaust memory has been localized in colonial and post-colonial settings. Caribbean literature offers a significant example of the transcultural operations of Holocaust memory, one that has been obscured by the institutional divide between Jewish and post-colonial studies. And uh, what I found is that one of the distinctive features of Caribbean Holocaust narratives is that they often identify not only symbolic resonances between Jewish and African diaspora experience, but also material intersections. Caribbean writers display an awareness of a multi-layered history of Jewish settlement in the region, extending from Jewish participation in the slavery uh, and plantation economy starting in the 17th century, to the flight of refugees from Nazism to the islands and Caribbean mainland in the 1930s. While such points of intersection have been obscured by what uh, the literary critic Brian Chayette calls disciplinary thinking, they come into focus in Caribbean imaginative literature. And I'm particularly interested in the capacity of literature as a medium of cultural memory to recover occluded histories and thereby challenge some of these disciplinary silos. So I'm going to try to um, share some uh, images now to uh, um, uh, help you uh, kind of follow along with some references that may be um, perhaps uh, somewhat unfamiliar. Can everyone, can you see the, uh, the slides? Yeah, they're visible. Yeah, okay. Um, so a case in point uh, is a small body of historical fiction and poetry that addresses Jewish wartime refuge in the Caribbean. Examples include Jamaican writer John Hearn's Land of the Living from 1961 and Antiguan author Jamaica Kincaid's novel Mr. Potter from 2002, as well as um, several other works by European Jewish writers who themselves followed this escape route to the Caribbean. Alternately ambivalent and identificatory, literary narratives of Jewish refuge in the Caribbean convey a permeability of Caribbean and European wartime memories not registered elsewhere. And what I'd like to do today is to address uh, one of the most recent and I think uh, richest additions to this literary corpus, which is Haitian author Louis-Philippe d'Alembert's Avant que les ombres s'effacent, or Before the Shadows Fade, uh, a, a novel from 2017, which tells the story of a Polish Jew who flees to Haiti in 1939. And I think this novel offers a very striking example of how Caribbean writers reshape Holocaust memory from a post-colonial vantage point. Steeped in references to Jewish cultural life, the novel at the same time brings into focus the Haitian cultural setting of its refugee protagonists resettlement and the Haitian diasporic presence in wartime Europe. 
centering a Haitian perspective on the war, Avant que les ombres s'effacent, not only exemplifies the capacity of fiction to recover a lost episode of Jewish history, but also illustrates how this act of recovery can serve to decolonize Holocaust memory. D'Alembert's novel can be read alongside a series of recent studies by historians such as Marianne Kaplan, Eric Jennings, and Joanna Newman that address refugee flight to the Dominican Republic, Martinique, and the British West Indies, as well as other sites I'm showing you here, also an image of uh, a site in Paramaribo, Suriname, where Jewish refugees were, were housed when they arrived. Uh, but while scholars have recovered these hidden histories of Caribbean wartime refuge, they have not yet turned their attention to Haiti with uh, the exception of a couple of Haitian scholars. Instead, Haiti tends to be introduced as a comparator in discussions that draw parallels between ho Holocaust and Haitian refugees. A more direct link between Haiti and the Holocaust was suggested by a post on the website of the American Joint Distribution Committee that appeared shortly after the 2010 earthquake in Haiti. The post noted that in a little known piece of JDC history, roughly 150 refugees made their way to Haiti. In the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's Holocaust Encyclopedia, the search term Haiti produces only two results, both relating to the post-war period. By contrast, a USHMM collection search yields a number of hits, including photographs such as, as these that I'm showing you, of Jewish refugees in Haiti and oral histories that make reference to Haiti. When official histories overlook certain experiences, more localized or extra institutional initiatives can work to fill in these gaps. And a notable uh, attempt to bring the Haitian story to light was a small 2010 Montreal exhibition entitled Juif et Haitien, une histoire oubliée. The exhibition sought to, and I uh, quote from the panel text, to evoke a forgotten history that of the actions taken by the Haitian government to save Jews from Nazi barbarism. The exhibit displayed naturalization documents, photographs, and letters recording the stories of refugees who fled to Haiti. The Montreal exhibition in turn served as a key source for D'Alembert's novel, and he cites uh, the exhibition uh, in, in his book. Storing, reshaping, and circulating the memory of Jewish refuge in Haiti more widely Avant que les ombres s'effacent illustrates how fiction can intervene into memory cultures by advancing new or alternative narratives. Fiction's unique traits as a medium of cultural memory enable D'Alembert to reframe the wartime past from a Haitian perspective. His novel supports memory studies theorist Astrid Earle's contention that literature is uh, characterized, quote, by its ability to refer to the forgotten and repressed, as well as the unnoticed, unconscious, and unintentional aspects of our dealings with the past. Literature does so, Earl explains, by bringing together different memory systems to generate, quote, new, surprising, and otherwise inaccessible archives of cultural memory. In the case of D'Alembert's novel, the memory systems in question are those of European Jewish Holocaust memory on the one hand, and Haitian slavery and revolutionary memory on the other. So the Haitian story of Jewish refugee rescue may seem a minor one at best, given the small numbers involved. In Delobel's telling, however, it becomes a major, even an epic tale. One of the advantages of the novel form with respect to marginalized histories is that the aesthetic impact of a protagonist's trajectory does not depend on it being part of a large scale phenomenon. Moreover, D'Alembert's rendering of Jewish forced migration not only spotlights Haiti as a destination, but also the Haitians' own uh, responses to Nazism. Finally, the novel constructs a counterpoint between Jewish refugee flight to the Caribbean and the Nazis' persecution of Caribbean expatriates living in wartime Europe to generate a multi-directional account of the war. D'Alembert's novel brings a characteristically Haitian literary interest in errance or errancy to bear on Jewish trajectories of migration. It centers on a, a character named Dr. Ruben Schwartzberg, who was born in Wuj in 1913 to a Jewish family 
that moves five years later to Berlin and the first of a series of displacements around which the novel's tripartite structure is organized. In the aftermath of Kristallnacht, uh, Rubin's family emigrate, members emigrate to New York, Israel, and Cuba. Meanwhile, after an ill-fated attempt to flee Europe on the St. Louis, Rubin ends up in, uh, back in Europe in Paris. There he comes in contact with the Haitian emigre community who take him under their wing and finally secure him safe passage to Haiti. While the novel's central protagonist is invented, the memories that it transmits are only partially fictitious. D'Alembert surrounds his fictional characters with a host of historical figures, including a number of Haitian intellectuals, I'm showing you some of them here, uh, as well as Otto and Shlomo Salzman, Austrian Jewish refugees to Haiti, uh, whose story partly inspired the novel. Moreover, the novel recovers a series of unremembered historical facts, including Haiti's proposal at the Evian Conference to establish a settlement of 50,000 Jewish refugees, Haiti's May 1939 decree enabling Jewish refugees to be naturalized in absentia, and Haiti's December 1941 declaration of war against the Third Reich. Blending fact and fiction is, of course, a characteristic feature of Holocaust novels. Unique to Avant que les hommes se fassent, however, is the range of historical references, the particular memory systems that it integrates into the fictional world it constructs. Referencing both Jewish and Haitian figures and events extending as far back as the Haitian Revolution of 1791 to 1804, D'Alembert recombines these historical details within the world of the novel to generate new meanings. And I think it bears emphasizing that in merging these memory systems against the backdrop of World War II, D'Alembert is not being anachronistic as perhaps we might think. Uh, the transformative encounters between European and Caribbean artists and intellectuals that D'Alembert's fiction stages were in fact a significant byproduct of the war as uh, historian Eric Jennings has recently shown. The manner in which novels mediate between the literary and the extra literary distinguishes literature as a vehicle of memory and enables it to reorient cultural perception. But what precisely is the alternative memory narrative that D'Alembert seeks to advance? I would argue that his ambition extends beyond recovering a little known story of Jewish refuge, although he certainly does that. In my reading, his larger aim is to reframe wartime history from the perspective of the margins. In his Discourse on Colonialism from 1950, the anti-colonialist writer M.A. Césaire famously maintained that colonial racism and European fascism were structurally connected, that Nazism was colonialism turned inward. As similarly, in a 1939 speech, the Haitian writer Jacques Roumain insisted that opposition to the concentration camps of Germany must be accompanied by equal opposition to the French colonial prisons in Vietnam and Tunisia. Under different masks, Roumain stated, the drama is played by actors motivated by an identical will to power. D'Alembert's novel, I think, extends and also deepens this connective intellectual tradition. The prologue of the novel recalls Haiti's 1941 declaration of war against the Nazi Reich and suggests that the Haitians' determination to come to the aid of the persecuted Jews stemmed from their revolutionary heritage, uh, from their awareness of their own history as the first state to abolish slavery. Haiti's offer of refuge to victims of Nazism is part of its larger resolve in the aftermath of slavery to, and I quote from the novel, to finish once and for all with the ridiculous notion of race. Acknowledging that Haiti's defiance of Nazism may appear inconsequential, the novel shifts this perception by refracting these historical details through the eyes of its Jewish protagonists. So uh, quoting from the novel, viewed from the outside in relation to the global human and material toll of a planetary conflict, the participation of the peace of island could seem laughable, not even a drop of rum in the Caribbean Sea, but in their eyes, it had a symbolic significance that was beyond measure. Thus, as Haitian author Danny Laferriere explains in a, re a review of the novel, 
While the world may have seen Haiti's declaration of war against the Third Reich as a joke, quote, uh, I'm quoting from Lafayette, it wasn't one because Haiti has always seen itself as being at the center of history. Also contributing to the novel's unconventional framing of the wartime past is the counterpoint that it constructs between the stories of Ruben Schwartzberg and Jean-Marcel uh, Nicolas, also known as Johnny Nicholas. As the novel recalls, Nicolas, a Haitian medical student, was arrested in Paris in 1943 for collaborating with the resistance and imprisoned in Buchenwald. Thus, if on the one hand, the novel recovers the forgotten journeys of European refugees to the Caribbean, it at the same time records a reverse migratory flow of Caribbean people into Europe and their wartime travails. So while disciplinary divisions between fields such as Holocaust studies and Black studies tend to compartmentalize different victim groups within the connective framework that D'Alembert constructs, their stories become closely intertwined. Moreover, in the novel's reciprocal narrative structure, Black and Jewish memories mutually activate one another. Haitians often serve as Rubin's interlocutors, drawing out his story despite his reserved nature and thereby becoming conduits of Jewish memory. Yet the reverse is also true as memories of the Haitian Revolution, the American occupation of Haiti, and Caribbean victims of Nazi persecution, such as uh, uh, Jean-Marcel Nicolas, all circulate within this Holocaust novel. But I think the novel's most striking uh, fusion of Haitian and Jewish memory systems is its introduction of a Caribbean philosophy of creolization, which rejects the idea of pure origins as a challenge to Nazi racial science. This conjunction is first articulated in the prologue, which casts Haiti's response to the Nuremberg laws as informed by its own experience of racial mixing resulting from plantation slavery. And I'll give just one last quote from the novel here. One must therefore not speak to them of the purity of the race, of authentic identity and all that bullshit. We are bastards and that's all there is to it. In keeping with the novel's Creolist poetics, after his arrival in Haiti, Ruben Schwartzberg learns the Creole language, undergoes a voodoo baptism and marries a Haitian woman. He thus comes to embody a Creolized Jewishness that is expressed on the level of form through the novel's dense intertextuality and its polyglot integration of Yiddish, Hebrew, and Haitian Creole phrases. And um, D'Alembert has commented about the novel that he felt his task as a novelist was to create this kind of linguistic uh, synthesis, to create this unique voice of, of the novel. So just to conclude, uh, in Avant que les ombres s'effacent, this interweaving of languages and cultures ultimately conveys the fundamentally creolized, impure character, not only of individual identities, but also of metropolitan and colonial histories. Challenging disciplinary thinking in D'Alembert's retelling the wartime experiences of Europe and the Caribbean are not separable, but instead are profoundly interlocking. To convey these confluences, D'Alembert harnesses the fictional privileges of literary narrative mediating between the real and the imaginary and combining apparently unrelated memory systems in unexpected and often quite startling ways. As a vehicle of cultural memory, literature has the capacity not only to recover forgotten historical episodes, but also to shift the vantage point from which history is narrated. Exemplifying this capacity, D'Alembert's novel generates images of the wartime past that transform our perception of it moving Haiti to the center of the story and thereby decolonizing Holocaust memory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was a wonderful paper and gets us off to a, to a great start. So thank you for that many multi-layered paper and, and uh, introducing a fascinating novel. We're going to, um, so everyone keep, keep that um, paper in mind, but we're going to move straight away to this, our second speaker. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Rita Lovica, um, who is Professor of Humanities at the University of King's College in Halifax, Canada. So continuing our Canadian emphasis this evening, uh, where she teaches classes in Holocaust and Genocide Studies, Gender Studies. Uh, 
in philosophy of race and critical theory. Uh, she is the author of, of many uh, works, uh, including a uh, monograph from the other side, Testimony of Effect Imagination, uh, published in Warsaw in 2017, and uh, Disappearing Traces, Holocaust Testimonies, Ethics and Aesthetics uh, in 2012, alongside edited collections and some uh, excellent articles, which I've had the pleasure of reading. Um, she has a position, a research position at the uh, link to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and her current project uh, focuses on areas of gender and Holocaust and intersections of the memories of the Holocaust and settler colonial genocide in North America, which is what she'll be uh, talking to us tonight about Holocaust memory and the settler colonial genocide in Canada. Thank you. You are on mute. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. That yeah. was uh, executive power that muted me. <laughs> Thank you so much. I am I'm really delighted to be here. I'm I'm grateful for this invitation, and it is just uh, that's something special about seeing friends from all over the world uh, showing up. Uh, so welcome everyone. Thank you. Um, I'm joining you uh, right now from Halifax or Chibuktok in Nova Scotia, Canada. And to the Mi'kmaq, the indigenous people who have lived here for at least 10,000 years, uh, this city has always been known as Chibuktok, which means great water. It was renamed Halifax and became the colonial capital of the region in 1749. Uh, Chibuktok and uh, so my university, where I am right now, are located in Mi'kmaq, uh, the ancestral unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, this territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship between the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy peoples and the British Crown, first signed in 1725. Uh, the treaties recognized the indigenous title to the land and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between, between colonial settlers and the First Nations in the area. And we are all obligated to honor the terms of the treaties. Uh, the colonial history of Nova Scotia, however, was anything but peaceful. And in the past for the Mi'kmaq, this beautiful land, it, it's really, really beautiful here, uh, located on the shores of the Atlantic was a moose hunting and fishing territory. But uh, from the colonial point of view, it was rich in natural resources and it was strategically located on the coast. So it became a focal point of the rivalry between France and England for the control of North America which of course had disastrous consequences for the Mi'kmaq. Uh, over the centuries, the original inhabitants and stewards of this land have been decimated. And uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, almost brought to the brink of extinction by war diseases and hunger. Uh, so the first point I think I should make in the context of this panel on Holocaust memory in post-colonial states is that um, in so far as no distinct Sazira separates the genocidal history of settler colonialism in Canada from its contemporary instantiations, Canada continues to be a colonial rather than a post-colonial state. Uh, as Canadian Indigenous scholars have argued, uh, vestiges of colonialism continue to be entrenched in Canadian law. I'm referring to the doctrine of discovery and terra nullius, which have stimied land claims, court, court cases, there is no formal recognition of indigenous sovereignty, that is nation to nation relations with the crown, as it was stipulated in the treaties. Legacies of Indian residential schools are taking a huge toll on indigenous communities. Uh, forced relocations of communities are still taking place today due to land spoliation or environmental racism. And despite the strikes that have been made in recent years in response to Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action, educational practices and the official policy of bilingualism continue to contribute to the destruction of indigenous cultures and languages. Uh, so, <coughs> excuse me, these continuities of colonial history may not be immediately apparent in the country that prides itself on 
benevolent forms of colonialism compared to the history of outright massacres and death marches, trays of tears, long walks, and so forth south of the border. And this is where comparisons between settler colonial violence and the Holocaust come in. And some of my recent work has been on the intersections of these two histories. And uh, just a quick note on how I am located with respect to these histories as an immigrant to Canada and as a beneficiary of its colonial history. I am a member of the settler population. Uh, the genocide of European Jews, on the other hand, is not only my research uh, main research area, but also part of my family history. I'm a daughter of a Holocaust survivor. Uh, so as, as such, from that kind of subject position, I will make three points. One is that my initial research was on the uses of the Holocaust by indigenous scholars and writers and on the reasons for these appropriations. But in the course of that research, I discovered what is my second point, that is how much we can learn about the Holocaust when we consider that history in the context of settler colonialism. And moreover, as a scholar doing research on the Holocaust in Canada and in the US, I cannot bracket the history of the locations in which I'm concluding that research. So I argue that the knowledge and memory of the Holocaust are always situated, that is refracted by the histories and topographies of the locations in which we do research. Uh, so my third point, <coughs> excuse me, will be about the generative potential of coali coalition, coalitional knowledge practices between Holocaust scholars and indigenous scholars. And there is a lot we could say about the comparisons with the Holocaust by indigenous scholars. And uh, I have looked at examples in both Canada and the US. Uh, the uses uh, of the idiom of survivorship, comparisons between Indian residential schools uh, and concentration camps, between forced relocations and Holocaust death marches, the bureaucratic machine of implementing genocidal measures, the role of gender and gender-based violence as a tool of genocide, and more recently, multi-generational consequences and transgenerational trauma. Um, it was hardly a coincidence that uh, such comparisons became common in the 1990s, considering that the 90s were the decade of the Holocaust when it rose to prominence in popular consciousness and popular culture. So on one hand, this omnipresence of Holocaust memory threatened to push those local histories of settler colonial violence even further into oblivion. And Michael Rothberg makes uh, a similar point in multidirectional a memory, though not with respect to um, indigenous histories. And the comparisons uh, were a response to that threat. But on the other hand, it was an opportunity to draw attention to those histories by means of comparisons. So point, of point, uh, point by point comparisons with the Holocaust were especially useful for indigenous scholars to push for the recognition of settler colonial violence under the provisions of the Genocide Convention. And in fact, contributions of indigenous scholars as well as non-indigenous scholars working on the subject drew attention to the political and ideological imbrications of the 1949 Genocide Convention, um, uh, especially the, uh, to the exclusion of the article on cultural genocide in the final version. And Canada was instrumental in forcing that exclusion. Um, the comparative tactics have been helpful in obtaining some official recognition in the, in, of the indigenous right to use the term genocide and in Canada for the first time in December 2015 in the report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission or in having statues and names of some of the most prominent Canadian historical figures removed from local landscapes such as uh, here uh, uh, of Edward Cornwallis, the founder of Halifax and more recently, Sir John uh, Macdonald, the first prime minister of Canada and de facto architect, architect of Indian residential schools and both have been amply compared to Adolf Hitler. Uh, the dynamic of intersecting memories of the Holocaust and settler colonial genocide in Canada has been lopsided since evocations of indigenous histories are absent in Holocaust memoirs, Holocaust scholarship and Holocaust commemorative practices, though this last one that is commemoration has been changing uh, and uh, increasingly we've seen the inclusion of indigenous histories of settler colonial violence, uh, for instance, during a uh, Holocaust Education Week. 
So the way I think about indigenous uses of the Holocaust, however, is not in terms of comparisons or like competition of suffering, but instead within the framework of what Canadian philosopher Miranda Fricker refers to as epistemic injustice. An epistemic injustice is harm done to a person in the capacity as a knower and a producer of knowledge. Uh, they are also at a disadvantage in conveying the knowledge to others because the person being addressed does not consider the speaker's words as credible a specific harm that Fricker calls testimonial injustice. And uh, under colonialism, epistemic and uh, testimonial injustice are rooted in a radical differential between settler colonial and indigenous memberships in the dominant community of knowledge. Or to quote Oglala Sioux scholar Vine Deloria Jr., why is knowledge about the world only valid and valuable when white scientists document and articulate it? That's in Red Earth, White Lies. These conditions require that indigenous knowledge holders and those who had experienced harm had to mediate the claim to historical intelligibility through white systems of understanding. And the knowledge about the Holocaust has been well integrated into white systems of understanding. In Indian residential schools, these cognitive mechanisms of excluding indigenous knowledge claims from the realm of intelligibility um, were forced with coercive measures, but according to indigenous scholars, as long as colonial epistemic frameworks have not been dismantled, uh, this genocidal project of annihilation of indigenous cultures and livelihoods has not come to an end. Uh, indigenous scholars refer to this phenomenon as cognitive imperialism or cognitive colonialism. And their arguments in turn help Holocaust and genocide scholars and scholars of human rights to recognize the limitations of these terms claims to universality. Um, and this is why it is interesting that in some recent works by indigenous scholars, which are kind of militantly separatist with respect to Western traditions of knowledge, uh, the Holocaust has been disappearing as a comparative device, which is an indication that these indigenous thinkers and writers no longer wish to position themselves as beneficiaries of Holocaust memory, burdened as it has been with Western conceptual baggage. So quickly, my second point is how our knowledge about the Holocaust can be fundamentally transformed if we allowed it to be interrupted by indigenous conceptions of history, knowledge, transmission, personhood, and trauma, and uh, the aspect that has already been written about by Tony Kushner, among others, uh, at some length is referred to as the colonial turn in Holocaust studies, that is the recognition of the continuity between Hitler's conquest of Eastern Europe and the history of colonialism and racial imperialism. Uh, the fact that the Holocaust was not a unique phenomenon, but it must be understood within the continuum of modern uh, European history. Uh, so maybe I just skip a little because that has already been touched upon in a, a previous presentation. Uh, so secondly, in Canada, much of the discussion about the legacies of uh, colonial violence has revolved around the concept of cultural genocide, which uh, Raphael Lemkin uh, described as a fundamental right of the group to exist. And the term has been gaining currency in the discipline of genocide studies partly in response to the assertion of indigenous people's cultural rights in the 2007 UNDRIP, uh, United Nations Declarations of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but it has not been commonly used by Holocaust scholars. And I find the concept of cultural genocide very useful to think about the annihilation of Eastern European Jewish culture, which is the culture of my ancestors, including the fate of Yiddish, the language of the majority of Ashkenazi Jews. And we know that Nazi Germany engaged in a deliberate and systematic destruction of Jewish cultural heritage, a pattern that is consistent with genocidal campaigns both prior to the Holocaust as well as more recent ones. In Germany of the 1930s, the destruction of Jewish books, libraries, places of worship preceded physical annihilation and it was carried out in the form of public spectacles. The progression of the campaign of mass murder in the early 1940s in Eastern Europe in particular was marked by an increased pace and fervor with which Jewish cultural heritage was obliterated. And all of this has been documented by Holocaust scholars, but only as a kind of secondary 
aspect with respect to, uh, in comparison to physical murder. Uh, and the same goes for the history of Jewish resistance, Amida, with its emphasis on armed resistance, why in fact, in most cases, it was resistance in the form of protecting cultural heritage. Um, and the same can be said about how we conceptualize Jewish survival and, and so forth. So I'd argue that a certain colonial mentality is ingrained in the Holocaust studies mindset regarding the destruction of the culture of Eastern European Jews, although this has been changing lately. And a symptom of that mentality, in my view, is thinking of the world of Eastern European Jewry as a vanished world. And that was popularized by Roman Vishniak, nostalgic portraits of the life of the shtetl, kind of frozen in time. But if we consider Vishniak's North American context, however, I don't think it is far-fetched to argue that the idea of the vanished world, which entails this memorial impulse to save it from oblivion, is redolent of the cultural myth of the vanishing Native American. And I'm thinking of the sculpture and of the tray, George Caitlin's portraits, James Fenimore Cooper's novels and so forth. And they were all monuments to a dying race. Uh, the cultural construct of a vanishing people or a vanished world conveys the idea of a group's culture as an artifact worthy of preservation, though as if separate from its members' physical existence, which is doomed to be extinguished. So my desire to reconsider our understanding of a vanished world stems from, and this for me is an unsettling realization that this trope and the way the lives of Eastern European Jews in general have been remembered may emanate from the same colonial knowledge paradigm. And this is not to undermine Holocaust survivors' mournful words about the vanished world of the childhood because I hold them in highest esteem, but I'm arguing for a need to consider the way in which the Western world after the war has remembered the Jews of Eastern Europe uh, and how this way is implicated in the paradigm of Western knowledge, which is an imperial colonial paradigm. Uh, just maybe a quick example, there are crucial differences to be considered, of course, especially in indigenous people's relation to the land and to the oral transmission of knowledge. Uh, one of the useful terms I've come across in my research that can be potentially applicable to cultural genocide and the Holocaust is libricide, the destruction of books and libraries, which in the words of Ruth Knuth, <coughs> excuse me, who coined the term, affects the foundation of the group identity for those uh, who, uh, whose self-identity is rooted in the tradition of written records, such as the Jewish people. But here, uh, Knuth quotes Barbara Tuchman, who said in one of her public lectures that, I quote, books are humanity. And this is a very powerful statement, but it excludes from the definition of humanity groups that rely on the oral transmission of the cultural identity. And as we said before, it was not a coincidence that these cultures were targeted by the oppressor through a direct assault on the spoken languages. So with, with much respect to, to both Tuchman and, and Knut, for me, this is an example of what indigenous scholars call cognitive imperialism. And uh, to conclude, as a Holocaust scholar who has engaged with histories of settler colonial genocide over the last few years, I've been dislodged from a Holocaust-centric way of thinking about mass violence and genocide. I've been forced to recognize the importance of decolonizing Holocaust studies. That is the need for Holocaust scholars to acknowledge our tacit complicity in perpetuating an oppressive knowledge system and to actively seek to revise its foundational concepts. And uh, in my view, to conclude, this can only be done in forging coalitions with indigenous scholars. And as a matter of fact, I think this is the first time in three years uh, since I presented on this topic at the Holocaust Museum that, that I'm, I'm presenting on this topic uh, by myself rather than uh, together with an indigenous scholar, which I think uh, is the way perhaps to, to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for a really powerful presentation and, and uh, provocative one as well. So we are adding to our, our rich collection of presentations and we'll no doubt be coming back to your presentation again shortly. Uh, our final speaker this evening is uh, Ronnie Michel Reilly, uh, who is a cultural historian, 
and uh, works on the intersection between Holocaust memory, contemporary Jewish history, and human rights, and uh, is currently a postdoctoral fellow at Yad Vashem. Uh, she she's currently working on a, a project that uh, I, I did a little bit of work on recently and, uh, and thought, thought this is something that needs a lot more work doing on Jewish deportees on Mauritius. So I'm delighted that you're, you're following that up. Um, and she is about to publish uh, a very important study, which I've, I've been very lucky to hear some in early stages of remembering the Holocaust and racial state, Holocaust memory in South Africa. Uh, from apartheid to democracy. Uh, and it's linked to that tonight. Uh, Ronnie's going to be speaking on, uh, on the Holocaust on trial in the racial state, reactions to the Eichmann trial in apartheid South Africa. Ronnie. Thank you so much. I will just share my, my screen. Okay. So uh, thank you, Tony, for the kind introduction. This paper is part of a chapter from uh, my forthcoming book, which explores cultural and discursive performances of Holocaust memory in South Africa during the apartheid years. And it focuses on the early 60s and reveals the ambivalent position of the South African Jewish community under apartheid by examining the reception of the Eichmann trial among the white communities in the country. The Jews' whiteness, as in the South African context, plays them in a much more powerful position than other minorities who were members of the Black, Indian, and colored communities. Jewish immigrants from Britain founded the Jewish community in South Africa in the early 19th century, and the community grew in the late 19th century with the arrival of Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe, primarily Lithuania. Given the right-wing pro-Nazism of Afrikaners during the 30s and the, 50, the, the 40s, uh, and including the direct influence of Nazism on the ideology of apartheid, the subsequent development of South African Jewish identity was ambivalent, fearful of the potential for state-sponsored anti-Semitism. The established Jewish community sought to demonstrate Jewish whiteness and loyalty to white concerns to secure a place of belongings for, Jew, for Jews under the apartheid government. And the, the accommodation of South African Jews within the white minority and their albeit uh, uh, ambivalent assimilation into whiteness was made possible by a relative change in the attitude of the national party towards the South African Jewish community during the 50s. In 1951, the ban on the Jewish membership in the Transvaal branch of the National Party was removed. And in 1953, South African Prime Minister Daniel Malan visited Israel, voicing his admiration for the Jews' ability to maintain their national identity despite centuries of adversity. Nevertheless, events in South Africa during the 50s and the early 60s reinforced the Jewish community's anxieties as apartheid rule progressed. The apparent disproportion of Jewish names in the list of those political opponents of apartheid accused at the treason trial and later on at the Rivonia trial deeply affected the public image of the Jewish community, thereby feeding its ongoing anxiety. The South African Jewish Board of Deputies and the community as a whole distanced themselves from the Jewish individuals who actively involved in the anti-apartheid struggle and accused, accused them uh, of threatening the entire community. The South African society was also shaken by the Sharpeville massacre of 21st March 1960, in which local police officers opened fire on a crowd of black protesters, killing 69 people. The massacre was reported worldwide, fueling anti-apartheid sentiments as the international conscience was deeply steered. The UN Security Council and governments worldwide, including Israel, condemned the apartheid policies that prompt this violent assault. The Jewish community itself made no official statement regarding the affair uh, in an effort to maintain uh, its, uh, what Professor Gideon Shimoni refers to as a long-standing uh, principle of non-involvement in inter internal political issues. When the Israeli foreign minister Golda Meir condemned the tragic events in South Africa, 
Her statement was featured throughout the South African press and relations between Israel and South Africa gradually deteriorated. This also led to local manifestations of anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish books, pamphlets, and circulars were published and distributed openly and anti-Semitic slogans appeared in community centers. Two months after the Sharpeville massacre, on a distant continent, Israeli agents captured the German Nazi SS officer and one of the major organizers of the Holocaust Final Solution, Adolf Eichmann, near his home in Buenos Aires. He was smuggled out of Argentina on May 20, 1960, and his arrival in Israel on May 22, accompanied with David Ben-Gurion's announcement to the Knesset on his capture, was the beginning of an affair that arose great interest all over the world. Journalists from many countries converged upon Jerusalem to cover the course of affairs, and the international public opinion followed its course avidly. The Eichmann affair was also a topic of major discussion in South Africa, and it was featured uh, prominently and extensively in the local press. And uh, a periodical report of the South African Jewish Board of Deputies from that period stated, relations between the Jewish community and the rest of the population have been influenced not only by many significant domestic development within the Republic of South Africa, but also by the historic events connected with the capture, trial, and execution of Adolf Eichmann. There can be no doubt that it did much to enlighten the moderate sections of the populace on the real implications of Nazism. However, it also stimulated a measure of activity among the professed supporters of Nazism in this country. Now, this description is not uh, completely accurate. In short, an examination of the national press reveals a much more critical reception of the Eichmann trial by the white communities in the country. Indeed, a discourse analysis of the Jewish press uh, reveals that the Jewish press made efforts to uh, expose the public to the horrors of the Holocaust through its comprehensive coverage of the affair. Moreover, the discourse analysis of the national press shows that the Jewish community was, uh, and of course the leadership was quick to respond to the publication of critical letters and articles uh, criticizing Israel uh, regarding the affair, uh, acquitting the, uh, such uh, manifestations as uh, anti-Semitic and as an act of contempt, toward, contempt towards the Holocaust and its victims. However, such an analysis also reveals the mountain scope of criticism voiced by the white society regarding the affair. And as I will demonstrate now, what was interpreted by the Jewish community as an anti-Semitism and a discretion of Holocaust uniqueness was actually an expression of what following Michael Rothberg, I will term a zero sum struggle regarding collective attitudes towards human suffering. <coughs> On 29 June 1960, a letter was published in the Star, which stated, and I quote, about the Eichmann affair, I wonder what the reaction of the Israeli government would be if a group of volunteers from, say, England were to arrive in Israel charged with the capture of the leaders of the Jewish terrorists responsible for the murder of so many British soldiers. The use of the term volunteers here is not at all accidental. As soon as the news of Eichmann's capture became public, Argentina demanded details. And in response, Israel issued what has been described as the one of the most undiplomatic notes in diplomatic history. The Israeli statement started that, and I quote, volunteers who happened to be Israeli had established contact with Eichmann and inquired whether he would come to Israel for trial. After he spontaneously agreed, they brought him to Israel and turned him over to the authorities. It further emphasized that Israel had been ignorant of these details until Argentina demanded an explanation and in, an investigation was conducted. So the use of the term volunteers in the letter was aimed at criticizing Israel's response for its lack of re reliability. Moreover, by defining members of the Jewish underground in the Jewish Yeshuv in Palestine during the British mandate as Jewish terrorists, the writer undermined the Jewish Zionist narrative 
uh, that perceived the struggle against the British mandate as a struggle for national liberation and the Jewish underground movements as national liberation movements. The letter furthermore emphasized that the Jews would do well to remember that they were not the only people to have suffered as a result of man's folly towards his fellow men. And of course, the Jewish community uh, issued an official response to this letter stating, and I quote, to place even by analogy in the same category events occurring in a conflict between two nations and those of the most brutal and wicked act of genocide in human history is irrelevant. While it is true that the Jews were not the only ones to have suffered at the hands of the Nazis, the Jewish people were the only nation against whom a deliberate act of genocide was planned and implemented. And the Jewish reaction above uh, properly reflects the, the perception of the uniqueness of the Holocaust, a dimension of its appreciable characteristic of South African Jewry since the early post-war years, even if it became more widespread among Jewish and non-Jewish constituencies following the 1967 war. And this perception is based on the claim that the Holocaust is a unique event, completely different from any other event in human history, and therefore any discussion of the Holocaust with another event is perceived as reductive, tasteless, or even morally or politically uh, questionable. Uh, and this perception was the source of frequent criticism in similar letters to the press throughout the trial, accusing the Jews for claiming ownership of human suffering. These letters constantly compared Jewish suffering during the Holocaust to the suffering of others in human history, forging a form of competition between different traumatic memories in a zero-sum struggle. The letters which, for the most part, dealt with the raising of local traumatic memories and their comparison with the Jewish trauma generally contained no claim of uh, Holocaust denial, although some argued for Jewish exaggeration and hypersensitivity about their trauma. These letters nonetheless reveal tensions between the various, uh, Jew, uh, the various uh, wh white communities in the country regarding the place of collective memories of suffering in the public arena. And this brings us to, to the uh, uh, multidirectional memory paradigm of Michael Rothberg, which steered the discussion of memory away from a co competitive models and claimed that the dynamic of different uh, historical memories are not necessarily based on a zero sum struggle. And instead of competition, he offers a more flexible model. Uh, uh, however, Rothberg focuses on the public articulation of collective memory by marginali marginalized or oppositional groups as carrying the potential for enabling other groups uh, to articulate their own claims for recognition and justice. But the memories of suffering that were invoked in the letters in the South African press were not memories of marginal groups, but rather those of the privileged white communities in the country. And uh, uh, historian uh, Dunbo Moody argued that the Afrikaner civil religion uh, is surrounded uh, by the sacred history, uh, which is made up of uh, two cycles of suffering uh, and death, the Great Trek and the anglo War. And these uh, cycles of suffering were amply represented in a letter uh, to Diavolk's Blood, written by Cape, a Cape Town a citizen under the uh, pseudonym Righteous. And he writes, it amazes, it amazes me that Germany, which was and still is a highly civilized nation, produced so many war criminals during the Second World War, while the Allies emerged with a, a, from, from the fight with so much honor. Now, one wonders what the followings are called. The British who threw 30,000 women and children into camps in the English war, the wiping out of the a German city of Dresden, when women and children were uh, chased onto an open square and put up, uh, under the initiating patrol bomb, when the American burned to death half a million Japanese women and children with their experimental atom bomb. Now I ask only, 
What are all these and numerous other cruelties, bravery, heroic deeds, Western achievement? Now, the writer did not deny uh, the extermination of European Jews by the Nazis, nor, nor did he defend Eichmann. However, he did express his displeasure at the fact that under the shadows of the Holocaust, uh, other crimes committed by the Allies were disguised. Moreover, the writer sing singled the uh, victims who had so far been perceived as perpetrators, the Afrikaners, the Japanese, and the Germans. While there is no doubt that in all those cases, innocent civilians were killed in bloody wars, the writer chose to ignore the difference between Holocaust victims and other victims of the war. And this comparison is problematic in Rodberg's terms since it does not reflect the difference between the rank of historical events that are described and thus undermine the possibility of creating empathy and solidarity. And while the official Jewish community rushed to denounce the, its, content, uh, in its content, I would like to turn to a response, a fascinating response made by a Holocaust survivor living in Cape Town who wrote, I have seen at various times that certain people doubt stories about the Nazi cruelties irrespective of the great mass of proofs, but immediately quote the stories of the British camps in order to explain what true cruelties are. Two wrongs do not make a right. Therefore, the gassing of millions of uh, innocent people cannot be condoned by the memory of 26,000 poor women and children who died in camps. Their suffering, like this, this, uh, that of the inhabitants of Dresden and Japan, was the ordinary fate of people in working regions. And this letter touches at the heart of the question of how to think about relations between different social groups, histories, or victimization, claiming that remembrance of one history does not erase others from view. The writer rejects the assumption made by many memory scholars. Uh, but in may, many memory scholars that the public space, uh, sphere in which collective memories are articulated is an arena of secrecy and that the, intera the interaction of different uh, collective memories within that sphere takes the form of a zero-sum struggle. However, it still makes the clear separation between the Jewish victims of the Holocaust and the Afrikaners, Germans, and Japanese who he perceived uh, as victims of war. And while uh, the, most of the local uh, newspapers uh, voice penetrating criticism of Israel regarding the affair, uh, illustrating the zero-sum struggle, I would like to conclude uh, with an example of one of the few rare voices pointing to the trial's relevance to the local social situation of apartheid South Africa. In an exchange published by uh, the Cape Times between the Israeli prosecutor uh, Gidon Ausner and the defendant Adolf Eichmann, Eichmann admitted moral guilt but denied legal responsibility for the Jewish tragedy. Eichmann implied that there, uh, there are those who give orders and those who carry them out, positioning himself on the obedient side. And evoking this defense, the article stated, it is easy to grasp to gasp with horror at the extreme effect of this outlook in the case of an official like Eichmann. It is easier still to ignore similar situations at home when the effects are less spectacular, but the principle is identical. When the relevant yeah, officials are, for instance, ordered to, to turn a dozen families out of their homes in the middle of a cold and wet spa, knowing that whatever the legal rights or wrongs, many babies and old people will be cold and probably wet for the night. Where does moral responsibility begin or end? This article was exceptional within the local news in South Africa. And uh, the article points to similarities between Nazism and apartheid through linking the legal and moral responsibility of the aggressors, the SS officers and South African police. Moreover, it, it's clear reference to the similarities between the deportation of Jews into ghettos and concentration camps and the expulsion of black families from their homes under the Group Area Act of 1950 reveals the essence of 
Rothbard's multidirectional memory, blending together the separate histories of non-white South Africans and European Jews while simultaneously allowing for the rearticulation of their specific condition. But in contrast, in contrast to uh, solidaristic interpretations of these histories, however, the competition model remained prominent. The struggle of a uh, prominent position in an imagined scale of human suffering increased the ambivalence position of the Jewish community as a separated, privileged cultural and religious group. The Jewish community enrolled the Eichmann trial to mediate the events of the Holocaust to the white population by focusing on the Jewish narrative of the Holocaust while overlooking the broader lessons that could be drawn from it into the local context, the community wished to provide the white public with an alternative narrative to identify with, mediating the Holocaust as a story about antisemitism and not of racism, and therefore diminishing its relevance for the local context. However, as there is no doubt that the local white society perceived the Holocaust as an integral part of the Jewish community's history and identity, the criticism regarding Jewish ownership over human suffering occupying the discourse overshadowed the community's efforts to use the Eichmann affair uh, instrumentally to contest antisemitism in the national public sphere. Instead of achieving empathy, the Jewish community's confrontational uh, preoccupation with the affair served mainly to perpetuate its own ambivalent status. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ronnie, and uh, ending our, our three papers so well. So. My task is to try and bring things together, which I won't do overly do. And I also want to leave space uh, for participants to, to ask questions. Uh, and we're running a fraction late. So I'll keep my comments brief. I'm like, I think it's very uh, fitting that we have a very international gathering this evening and that meeting that we've covered Haiti, South Africa, Canada, we've also I think, uh, I think this is very significant, covered and, and crossed over disciplinary lines. So literary, cultural studies, political history, anthropology. Uh, and that I think is a very rich way ahead. What I, th I think it's interesting that we uh, are still engaging with uh, Michael Rothberg's multi directional memory. His book was published in 2009. And it's a book I think that we should keep coming back to. I, I find it both um, seductive, but also uh, in some ways problematic. And I think some of those issues have come out tonight of, of what still needs to be addressed. And I think one of the things that to me is lacking is, is power relations. And that, that came out very strongly in uh, both uh, Ronnie's paper uh, and uh, in director's paper as well of, of how we have to put things into context. Whereas um, Sarah's shows equally how, how his model can, can work and be very illuminative uh, and, and constructive as well. So I think it is a book that is, is worth going back to and going back to. It's been something that I've been very aware of in, in the UK over recent months um, and a very sort of stressful time um, in, in Britain uh, as we uh, embark on leaving Europe uh, and uh, have a, a top world-class leader um, who has uh, produced a sort of response to COVID, which is of so course world leading. Um, but, uh, one thing that has been a, a sort of more than an echo of, of what's been going on in the States is the sort of Black Lives Matters. And, and I've been involved with, with, with issues uh, connected to what is very modest proposals to commemorate nationally slavery in Britain, and which at the moment is not going anywhere at all. Um, whereas uh, the, the British government is funding over 100 million pounds for a Holocaust Memorial, which will be next to the Houses of Parliament and will be very celebratory. So again, I think that Rothbergian model of, of, of memory that can be constructively engaging is, is 
is politically very, very important um, to keep hold of, but in practice, it, 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 it seems to be somewhat lacking. I'm, I'm still intrigued uh, with the comments that, that um, with what Sarah outlined of how it seems that literary studies uh, provides a better bridge or an easier bridge between Holocaust studies and post-colonial studies. And I, I wonder if we can tease out why that is the case. It's certainly in terms of literary approaches um, uh, that, and cultural studies, it, it's certainly been the case in, in UK academia um, where there is still unfortunately a, a great divide and I, I think it's still I was very much taken by Dorita's comments about how she's presenting on her own today but normally would, would hopefully present with an indigenous scholar as well uh, and that there's still however hard we try seem to be a sort of a lack of mixing in the sense of, of um, post-colonial studies not fully engaging with holocaust studies and vice versa and we we, we meetings like this, I think are really crucial to try and think through, but we've still got a long way to go, as I think we, we sort of see in terms of who's participating tonight. So I, I, I don't want to, to go into the too much details of the paper, because I think they're gonna be, uh, questions will be asked of, from the audience, and I want to give the space to that. I just would, would praise each one for, for showing the complexity, uh, the nuances, uh, but also I think the potential um, and the challenges that are ahead. So uh, I would like to leave it there and open it up um, for the last 15 minutes for, for questions. Daniela. Yes, thank you so much, Dorita. Um, First of all, I want you all to uh, check out the chat. Chaim Sperber from the um, Western Galilee College is going to upload um, a call for papers for our uh, workshop. And uh, Jan, are you here to, to ask the questions? No, Jan, Jan's internet is, is, uh, has crashed, so uh, he's not with us. Okay. Um, so we have a, a general question from uh, Shmuel Yerushalmi. Um, and he asked all three participants. Uh, When we speak about Holocaust, we must include not only the Holocaust of the Jews, but also uh, to speak more broadly about the uh, disasters and genocides of other people. And um, uh, can you comment on, on, uh, on this issue, all of you? Maybe we start with Sarah. Can you, can you okay? Can you read the question again? Sorry. We can we we can even yes. ask Samuel uh, Samuel just to to explain what what his question is. Samuel, can you uh, can you help us here? Yeah, I hear. Thank you. Okay, uh, my question uh, uh, relation. Uh, uh, to connection uh, between uh, between the uh, Holocaust uh, of Jews uh, in Europe uh, uh, to other uh, disasters uh, and uh, collapse uh, in the world. Uh, uh, I know uh, uh, alike uh, to the genocide uh, against uh, the people uh, of Africa, a genocide. Uh, uh, against the uh, Indians uh, in America uh, and other uh, uh, collapse uh, along uh, uh, humanity history. Uh, and uh, I want uh, to know uh, how exactly uh, we can uh, today uh, to cause uh, to governments uh, and the people around the world uh, uh, to see a uh, Holocaust uh, 
or the any universal any universal lesson to next generations for to prevent a holocaust i can to see new holocaust in the future this is my question okay thank you so sarah would you like to go first um okay thank you uh for the question i I'm not sure I can really speak to the question of, of preventing future genocides, but in terms of the sort of um, a necessity of thinking these histories together, and, and perhaps a little bit thinking back to Tony's comment about literature as, as a medium as well, um, and some of the differences perhaps between um, you know, other uh, forms of memorialization, um, political discourse, and so forth. I guess what I'm finding in my research is uh, on, on literary um, texts is a, is a focus on stories, uh, biographies of individuals that really um, can bring together these different histories in a way that becomes inescapable. And that's true um, both of fictional creations like the, the protagonist of this novel that I spoke about um, today who crosses these geographies and goes from uh, Poland to, to Germany to, to Haiti, um, but also some of the um, in my larger research right now on uh, black victims of Nazi persecution, some of the figures I'm following, again, in their own biographies, bring together these histories. So to give just a quick example, I'm looking at uh, an artist um, from the Dutch Caribbean colony of, of Suriname who had both uh, Jewish and African heritage. And so already, you know, in his biography, there is this confluence of these histories. And then he travels um, from the Caribbean first to the United States and then to Europe and gets caught up in the war and interned by the Nazis in Bavaria. This, I'm just give this bi one biography as an example of how I think sometimes we think of these histories as very separate and we talk about these sort of abstract analogies. Um, can we compare these things? But in much of the research I've been doing, it's really uh, the way in which they intersect in the lives of individuals that's become very interesting to me. And I think the Caribbean is a particularly striking site because identities are so complex there and so mixed. And you have um, Jewish lineage that runs through many of the islands as well. So, um, so, so that's sort of the uh, approach that I've been taking to this question of comparison is really to focus on, on these uh, uh, historical uh, intersections that are in the biographies, often in the backgrounds of the writers themselves, and that also come out in, in the fiction. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, Dorota, you have a question from uh, Dan Stone. You can also uh, comment on uh, this question, but please keep it short because we are running out of time. So the question to you is uh, how, how do you view the collections of survivors oral histories um, with your, uh, let's say, critic about over reliance on Western traditions? Thank you. That is a fantastic question. Thank you, Dan. Can I just say one thing in response to the previous one? Although, you know, yes, it, would, of course. it would require a very long answer, but very quickly, the way I think about it is that no genocide stands on its own. And I think that's what I was trying to illuminate in my paper that uh, when we look at what instance of the genocide, in my case, uh, the Holocaust, it allows us to shed light on another instance of the of, of another genocide and vice versa, because these are kind of long durée historical patterns that unfold globally and they also unfold across various geographical locations. So I think it's imperative that we look at those interconnections. So it is imperative, in fact, that we uh, address these issues uh, comparatively. But I have to stop myself here, uh, although I would like to continue and return to Dan Stone's question. Uh, I think that is phenomenally interesting. Uh, I, I would begin to answer by trying to think about the status, the status, and I think very different status of a kind of oral transmission of knowledge in uh, Jewish history and Jewish culture and indigenous cultures. So there are very, there are, I think, important distinctions to be made and kept in mind. But it would be also tremendously interesting to turn to the 
uh, the way that the, the existence of oral history uh, um, um, archives, such as the Shoah Foundation, Fortunov, etc., how perhaps that shapes, I don't know, uh, our understanding of the Holocaust, but also, again, the status of, uh, uh, of oral histories in Jewish knowledge and, and so forth. But what I really want to say <laughs> is that very recently there has been a conversation, and actually my colleague Lorena Fontaine, who is involved in that conversation, is in the audience, so a shout out about uh, uh, there is a vast collect collection of depositions uh, from Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada. These oral histories have now been recorded, very similar to histories of Holocaust survivors, accounts of Holocaust survivors. So now there is some conversation of like bringing those two resources together. And uh, actually for, for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, depositions to be included in the Shoah Foundation. And so again, to have that kind of engagement and uh, researchers being able to work on those two depositories of knowledge from very different traditions, yet to orchestrate a kind of dialogue between them, I think would be immensely rich and uh, it will probably yield insights that we, that, that again would enrich our understanding on both genocides and the very concept of genocide, maybe even transform it. Thank you so much. And uh, Ronnie, you have a question from uh, Jack Zygman about the awareness of Argentina of the hunt and capture of Eichmann. Uh, but also please comment on the first question. And right after you, uh, Dr. Boaz Cohen, please give, give us our uh, concluding remarks. Thank you. So uh, I'll combine the two, uh, the, the first question and Jack Sigmund's uh, 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 note here uh, and start by saying that I'm a historian. So I'm interested in how uh, things were perceived in history. Uh, so uh, if it's, it's true that uh, Argentina knew or or didn't, didn't know about the Mossad capturing Eichmann, it doesn't matter. What mattered to me uh, is how uh, it was manifested in uh, public discourse in South Africa at the time. Uh, and, uh, and for the, the, the first question about the uh, Holocaust and genocide, uh, I think uh, that what's really uh, happening here, what happened here today at the panel was, uh, uh, was a, 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 an effort to, to create a space for entangled histories and memories of Holocaust and genocide. And I can say from my point of view and from my research, research on South Africa, that while most of my, my PhD dissertation and my uh, forthcoming book focused on the ways in which the white communities in the country perceived the Holocaust, I, I, I felt that it, it is incomplete uh, without uh, the voices, uh, the, the non-white voices, the voices of the black, Indian, and colored. And uh, so I, de I de did dedicate two chapters uh, uh, focusing on the ways in which Holocaust memory was uh, perceived by uh, 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 political act uh, uh, activists uh, who were not part of the white communities. Uh, one of them was Desmond Tutu, the Archbishop of Cape Town, and uh, the other was Ahmad Muhammad Katrada. And uh, this led me uh, to, uh, to, to realize that, uh, uh, for example, the diary of Anne Frank was smuggled onto Robben Island uh, during the late 60s and uh, became uh, the second Bible for, uh, for the political prisoners. Uh, and uh, they uh, circulated it, they copied it, uh, and I was very fortunate to to find in the Robben Island archive the secret notebooks of Ahmed Katwada, where I found 13 quotations from the diary. And also, uh, I was uh, very lucky to, uh, to be able to interview him six months before he died. Uh, 
realizing that uh, the Holocaust, as he perceived it, because he, he was an uh, anti-apartheid activist, he was part of the uh, Communist Youth League in the 40s, and uh, so he, uh, uh, he was uh, acquainted with uh, Nazism and the Holocaust uh, from a very specific angle. Uh, and, uh, and in, uh, uh, in 1951, he visited, uh, he went to, to Poland and visited Auschwitz and he took uh, bones, human bones from the ground and he decided to take it with him back to South Africa and used it as a material display in his political speeches. So uh, of course, as uh, uh, by stating that those are bones that are of, of Jewish victims, and this is the, the devastating consequences of racism. So I, I think that it is important to, to, to detect those connections in history and also in, in the present, but that's, that's my take. Boaz, the floor is yours. Boaz Cohen, you are on mute. Thank you for this uh, fascinating panel. I must say that this was Ronnie Michel Ariely's uh, initiative. And this has brought us, which are more uh, a regular or a Holocaust focused historians uh, into unknown, uncharted fields. And uh, I think this is, uh, for me, a, a, an affirmation of, of how the Holocaust, that Holocaust of the Jews, is, has become a, a, a signpost, a, a, a point of reference from which a other a victims found their place and, and a place for their stories. A, and I think this is, a, when we talk with our students in Israel, which are Israelis and are very uh, naturally focused on, what, on uh, the Jewish and Israeli story, and we try to explain to them how the Holocaust is a major event in world history because its implications are those that were shown today, and not also because of this. And I think this was a very strong uh, point, which I will uh, share with my uh, students. Uh, we are uh, continuing our project. I will say, I'll give a notice which is not yet published, but it is important. Those of you who are teaching and have students, we are uh, going to start somewhere in February, the Israeli second semester. We're going to start an international course of uh, startups in uh, Holocaust memory, open to students from wherever in the world. And it's not an academic lecture course, it's a uh, it's an innovation course. We are working with one of the uh, firms in Israel which uh, specializes in uh, what is called project-based learning internationally. And we are going to have a course and uh, we'll send it out on our list, but this is a, a, a like a, 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 pro, a, a first call saying that if you have students that may be interested, it will be very, uh, only a small sum just to register and you have to be accepted too, but uh, generally we're opening it worldwide. I mean, it will be open worldwide. I will teach the uh, Holocaust angle and we'll have a whole team of people who are specializing in uh, project-based learning, helping the uh, form groups, international groups doing uh, new startups, startups in Holocaust memory. And uh, once we have this written down, uh, uh, promotionally, we'll send it out also in the mails, but uh, I wanted to share this with you. This is another international project we are starting now. And uh, next, uh, and, uh, next uh, month, we'll have uh, 
a different type of event, going back to an event centered on a distinguished Holocaust researcher. And we'll have a Professor Omer Bartov here uh, for a discussion with Jan Buzlav. This will be Wednesday, December 9. So I'm already saying this, we'll uh, start sending out uh, notices uh, very short, uh, very shortly. And uh, we hope to see, we are very happy for anyone, everyone who came into this lecture today, uh, indeed an international event, and we'll uh, be happy to see you in future events. So thank you very much. Thank you for the online team of Daniela, Roni, and Jan, and uh, the rest of the college backup team who made this happen. So thank you, and thank you for the speakers and uh, to Professor Kushnir. Thank this, you everyone so much. This will be the time to say goodbye. Goodbye. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dorotha, Sarah, Tony. It was uh, a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Rani, so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was so wonderful to be here with everyone, literally everyone. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you to the speakers for making it uh, such a great evening. I, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you for meeting us, Tony, and for your introductions and comments. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I may just, uh, I wish I had more time to respond, but uh, okay, we can't, <laughs> we can't continue. Uh, oh, Athena, I can. Hi, I have so nice to see you. Athena. Nice to see you, Athena. <laughs> We continued. We continued. Yeah, yeah. This is wonderful. This wonderful, wonderful discussion. Yeah, can't wait to be more part of it. Uh, maybe I would just finish that thought quickly uh, in response to something you said, Tony. That like in Nova Scotia, we are now really engaging those intersections of the memory of settler colonial violence and slavery in Nova Scotia that we didn't even know existed a few years ago. So recovering those histories of slavery in Canada, which everyone, a lot of people believe it didn't happen here, right? But it is only now that we are acknowledging it. And then also seeing how they are both part of settler colonialism and how they have to be you know, actually intersected, right? For, for, this, for these patterns to emerge, not to mention the expulsion of the Acadians. There are all of these like genocidal histories that are so intertwined. And like someone asked me about Scotland, I didn't have time to address that, but like Edward Cornwallis was like famous for massacring Scottish Highlanders. And that's why they sent him to Halifax because he was really good at pacifying restive populations. You know, and then we have Nova Scotia, which is like all myth with like bagpipes and uh, tartan, etc. It's just so, it's just this beautiful fake myth that we have constructed, right? So it just goes to say how even in this little place, it is so interconnected and has to be seen complexly. Otherwise, uh, we are just kind of perpetuating, I think, the old patterns of thinking. We're doing some work here. Uh, Southampton has a sort of rivalry with Plymouth of the place the Mayflower left from. And as it's the 400th anniversary, they, they, there's been a very good movement here to sort of make this less of a celebratory narrative and, and to work with indigenous groups and uh, the particular groups who are impacted directly uh, 400 years ago. And that's been very successful. I mean, COVID has stopped celebrate uh, commemorations that would have been you know, exchange visits and so on, but it, it, it has enabled <coughs> partnerships to emerge. So, yeah, not, not totally popular in the city. There are those that don't like that narrative. Obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tony, I will write you separately about Mauritius. I'm, yeah, I'm actually curious. But uh, you mentioned that you you worked a bit on the subject, so I'll... I'll... Um, yeah, a, a bit is, is the accurate description. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's more uh, than I know of uh, anyone else. Yeah. So, um, yeah. No, it was, it was in relation to... I've, I've been doing work on the concept of illegal immigration and, and 
the Palestinian authorities mm. and how they sort of use this as a sort of deterrent and, and uh, as a, a sort of model of, uh, and yeah, so I, I think it, you know, I just was fascinated by it and thought someone should do some really detailed work because there's so many discourses at work there uh, and, and yeah. policies as well. Um, and Britain at the moment is coming up with, ever, well, not Britain, but the Home Office coming up with ever more ludicrous schemes to rem the people trying to get from, from France to Britain by sort of rubber dinghies and the like. Uh, and any island that's a long way away is being suggested uh, mm. by the Home Secretary, who is absolutely appalling uh, person. And uh, Mauritius, I'm not sure if Mauritius has come up, but it, they've, they've come up with other places where there's no transport to, to get the people there, let alone <laughs> other yeah. shoes. So um, it's, it's very much in that sort of colonial way of, of of thinking of removing problem deterrence and so on. So yeah, I'm, so I, I must have written about a page about it. So that's, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's it. But but the, you know, there's good stuff in the colonial office files. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm I actually need. I have to submit to Athena a paper soon <laughs> about it. Yeah, uh, but it's ready. It's ready. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm not worried. <laughs> is it is it the one you presented in Washington, Ronnie? No, it's it's a, it's actually more focused on 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 the British per, uh, perception oh, of uh, of the Jews and uh, yeah, it's a, it's it's interesting because it's uh, I found some interesting uh, uh, British uh, documents on Trinidad and how oh. they were they were actually thinking uh, uh, between Mauritius and Trinidad, but Trinidad was too close to America. So how can we, you know, create a Dachau in America, like so close to America? But Mauritius is fine because it's it's so far away. Yeah. And, yeah. But it's uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. The British, uh, the British have a lot to answer for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. As, do, uh, oh. as do any other places. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But yeah, I look forward. This, the, that's the, that'll be the virtual AJS, along with mm -hmm. all the other multiple amazingly interesting uh, virtual discussions that we're having all at the same time. Unfortunately. Yes. Yes. It's a. It's it. It turns to be a very busy schedule with the Zoom. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have my global transit, which actually your discussions fit into so well, German Historical Institute discussion at exactly the same time that you're having the next, um, your next mm. event in December. So, it, which is just typical of how we're all toggling and it's all endlessly interesting. And but we're recording, so it's, uh, yeah. we can, uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> anyway, goodbye. Bye, Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Tony, I found some new stuff on the peddlers I'll send you. Fantastic. Thank you very yeah. much. Sure. I need to get back to the peddlers. <laughs> okay. We'll find time and do it. Hi, Myrna. I can't see you, but waving to you. <laughs> it's been wonderful. I have to go back to my office hours now, uh, which are in progress. Well, <laughs> well, it was a pleasure even to to listen to your, I like what you're talking about. I think it's critical to deal Thank with you. the genocide of First Nations and and other genocides, and mainly cultural and physical genocides. And I think we have to talk about them um, together because they're different and yet they're totally related. So, okay, we'll talk about it. Yes, yes we Yes, bye I bye. call you. <laughs> bye. <laughs> nice to meet you, Dorota. Good night. Oh, nice to meet you. Like, I hope to see everyone in person one day. I'm very much an in-person person. So Zoom doesn't mm. quite. Uh... Bye. <laughs> Thank you so bye, much. Honey. It's such a pleasure. Thank wow. you. Bye-bye. Thank you.